Hello everyone, and welcome. In this video, I'll be talking about the Wendigos of the Fallout universe. With that being said, let's get into the video. Wendigos are mutated humanoid creatures that are encountered in Appalachia post-war in Fallout 76. Individuals such as Morris Stevens have transformed into these creatures via their participation in the act of cannibalism. Pre-war urban legends surrounding the Wendigo cave within the Savage Divide became reality when the first Wendigo that we know of made its home there. While many Wendigos exist in Appalachia, only a handful can be specifically traced to a named person pre-mutation, with each person that mutated having largely unique circumstances leading to their transformation. The only constant in each scenario is the consumption of human flesh prior to becoming a Wendigo, though that does not explain their exclusive presence in Appalachia, although it is possible, considering Fallout 76 is the latest game, that this kind of lore will be retconned later on and we might see them in sequels, we don't really know. We also don't know why Wendigos were not commonplace before the Great War. It is a theory within the community, however, that the addition of nuclear radiation could be responsible for the mutation. Erli Williams became a cannibal so addicted to human flesh he was willing to kill for it in 2076, before the dropping of the bombs, but it's unclear when his physical mutation started, pre-war or post. Additionally, many of the recorded cases involve mental degeneration shortly before the transformation, though it is unknown if that is a requirement for the mutation to take hold or just a symptom exhibited before turning. Wendigos have a similar radiation resistance to that of feral ghouls and are sometimes found among small groups of them, and acid can also be harvested from their teeth, insinuating that that is part of their physiology. Wendigos are carnivorous, and when hunting, make no distinction between humans and animals. When alerted, they make raspy breaths, and they have the ability to let out a piercing scream to intimidate and stagger their prey. Wendigo strikes are so fierce that even when someone is wearing power armor, an attack will still cause them to be staggered. And if someone gets into a position where they cannot be physically attacked, the Wendigo will still make an attempt to do so. Using their previously mentioned shriek, they can attract a horde of feral ghouls to the location. This further solidifies the relationship that feral ghouls and Wendigos have as a kind of goon and villain-esque relationship. And although this is a rare phenomenon, it has been noted that Wendigos may perch atop tall and out-of-sight locations, allowing them to better ambush prey. One example that has been seen with Wendigos doing this is when they perch on trees overlooking the central roads of the mire. Now, let's talk about the different variants of Wendigos, and I will be talking about the Wendigo Colossus just later on in the video. Ravenous Wendigo have a reddish, fleshy appearance with darker and muddled colours. This gives them a form of camouflage to blend in into dimmer and more urbanised environments, making them more powerful and more of a threat. The glowing Wendigo has been exposed to more radiation than your general Wendigo, just like how other glowing variations of animals work, and of course the glowing ones when we talk about ghouls. They are normally seen in hordes of up to two or three Wendigos, including themselves. Scorched Wendigos have been infected with the Scorched Plague. All the other variants have a corresponding Scorched variant, although they are all physically the same. This may occur when they are attacked by Scorched Beasts or the Scorched Beast Queen, becoming allies with other Scorched creatures. It's also worth mentioning that there is the Wendigo spawn, which are identical in physicality to glowing Wendigo, the only real difference being that they fight alongside the Wendigo Colossus. There are many locations in which Wendigos have appeared. These include Pylon Ambush Site, Williard Corporate Housing, Garum Estate, Fort Defiance, Eastern Regional Penitentiary, Haven Church, Lewisburg, Freddy's Fears House of Scares, Garden Mining Headquarters, Mountainside Bed and Breakfast, Big B's Rest Stop, 
KMAX Transmission, Centica Roads Visit Centre, Tega Emergency Services, Dropsite C2, Dropsite G3, Firebase LT, Sarles Grinders. One may appear in Lake Eloise's surroundings. Wendigos also appear in high numbers during a Colossal Problem event. Up to three Wendigos consistently appear on the road south of Abbey's Bunker by the truck suspended by vines. Groups of Wendigos appear between the White Spring Golf Club and a fissure site. There is a possibility for a Wendigo to spawn at Hawk's Refuge in a small cavern off of the main cave. Wendigos reliably spawn inside the Wendigo Cave, and the Night Stalker always appears at the end of the One Violet Night event. Now to talk about the previously mentioned named individuals who have turned into Wendigos. Morris Stevens, later known as the first Wendigo, was the former leader of the Gourmands, one of the five raider groups. He led this cannibalistic raider group with his wife Edie. Members of the Gourmands were known as freaks, grisly and inhuman by the other gangs. Likely due to their cannibalistic nature, they unsuccessfully tried to exchange human flesh for goods with raider vendor bots, which they then left a note specifically addressing this. Note to the Gourmands, human flesh is not an acceptable tender here. The members of the Gourmands include Bob, who wrote terminal entries about the events that occurred at Bolton Greens, as well as about the other members. Bill and Cantoon two other members had a fight because Cantoon believed women tasted the best rather than men. Cantoon was described by the other Gormans as a weirdo without mercy, which considering that he was in a group of cannibal raiders says a lot about him. Vanessa was married to another member, Gregory, and they had a young daughter. Jerry was described as having science smarts by his fellow raiders, as he was able to rig up one of the rooms at Bolton Greens to safely store the gang's meat supply so that super mutants and mole rats would not attack their location. He fell into the sunken church sinkhole in the mire and was trapped alongside Park Ranger Kevin and Scott Conroy, who had both been trapped there since before the Great War. Mickey was the first contact the pair had seen, so he had to explain that the apocalypse had taken place while they were trapped inside. Mickey strangled Kevin to death in his sleep, and he explained to Scott that Kevin needed to die so that they could live, which makes sense for a cannibal raider. The two then ate Kevin. Mickey was later killed and eaten by Scott, who was descending into madness and became a Wendigo, but we'll get onto his case later on. The only other character worth mentioning is that they also had a vendor robot raider, but it wasn't specifically for them, or uh, customised or unique, so it's not really that important. But let's get back onto Morris Stevens' story, shall we? Now, in the Gourmand's rules, it was very established that there was a code of never eat your own. But due to a recent shortage of their food supply, as well as Stevens' increasingly depraved fixation with cannibalization. It led him and his wife to murder Jerry and then murder Gregory. They also thought about murdering Vanessa, but she was too much of a skilled fighter and a valuable asset. Once the other members found the half-eaten corpse, Morris, despite his place as leader, was expelled from the Gourmands along with Edie. He then took shelter within the Wendigo cave, where his fixation worsened to the point that he devoured his wife and mutated into a Wendigo. As the first known Wendigo, he continued to prey on his former gang and other raiders in the region, to the point where a considerable bounty was placed on his head, though none would come to successfully claim it. Stevens was killed once the Vault Dwellers of Vault 76 followed his trail in order to obtain the key fragment he still had in his possession. There is also a rather disturbing holotape depicting Morris after killing his wife and realising that his fixation had gotten the better of him. Edie, darling Edie, oh, how delicious you were. The sweet taste of your flesh is, as it passed down my throat. Oh, the syrupy warmth of your blood. 
for our next case of Camp Counselor Nia. Nia worked with two fellow Pioneer Scout counselors at Count McAdam, Layla McAdams and Ronnie McAdams. She did not believe Layla's initial stories about monsters and Ronnie's disappearance. Nia began seeing strange things in the stars, and when Ronnie vanished, Nia began to consider what Layla had told her, Nia followed the night sky along an expedition to find out what was happening in the area. It is unknown how, but she transformed into a normal Wendigo, though she wears the remains of her Pioneer Scout's outfit and hat. It appears that she sustained herself using cannibalism, eating the campers while out of sight of the other counsellors. We learn all this information through the Campfire Tales event. Nia is also connected to the Invaders from Beyond DLC and the Flatwoods monster. Although that is a story for another day, there is this holotape describing events in between the transformation of becoming a Wendigo and knowing that something is odd in the area. That's it. I'm going on an expedition. I have to hunt down whatever's been tormenting the kids for the past few months. <sighs> First, I didn't believe her about the darkness, the shadows, the monsters. Even though I started seeing irregularities in the stars. And now that Ronnie's gone missing, I, I can't turn a blind eye. I have a theory about what's out there, and, and I'm going to follow the night sky to my answer. It's far, and I've never been on an expedition alone, but, but I have to try. I'll find the cause of all this weirdness. For Layla. For Ronnie. Now, in this case, we talk about the previously mentioned Scott Conroy. Now, let's talk about the previously mentioned Scott Conroy. Scott Conroy, who would commonly go by Scoot, lived in a shack in what would later become the Mire, with his 12 cats. At one point, he attempted to write an advertisement putting them up for adoption, but he could not finish the draft. Scott was a member of the Truth Seekers, a club dedicated to hunting cryptids, with his friend Calvin Van Lowe and Ray Gary. Calvin announced that he had been accepted into vault Tech University and would no longer be able to participate in the group. Scoot became bitter. Though Ray continued their cryptid hunting activities, Scoot began to believe Ray was simply appeasing him, worsening his bitterness. Scoot set out to debunk reports of a Sheep Squatch, the cryptid that both Ray and Calvin were interested in. During an expedition to investigate an alleged Sheep Squatch sighting, he found an albino deer, considering that enough evidence against Calvin's claims. The last time both Ray and Scoot saw each other was in August of 2076, during which Ray attempted to introduce a new member, Shelby O'Rook, who Scoot treated disrespectfully after learning that, much like Calvin, she attended Vault Tech University. Despite their declining relationship, however, Scoot still kept in contact with Ray after the years, just barely though, through Ray's wife, Lauren, who helped feed Scoot's cats while he was away on his expeditions. Ray himself was wheelchair-reliant by then, and could not leave his house in Welch, and Scoot did not ever visit them there. By 2077, Scoot's attention turned to hunting ghosts with his acquaintance, Sean, which led him to the sunken church. While investigating the church, on October 19th, 2077, he fell into a sinkhole and broke both of his legs. He accepted he was going to die and wrote a note asking for people to feed his cats, but to leave the note in case someone he knew found it, 
and him. The next day, a park ranger named Kevin fell into the sinkhole. Kevin taught Scoot how to survive on water, moss, and bugs. About three months after they were trapped there, Mickey, a member of the Gourmands, fell into the sinkhole as well. Mickey choked Kevin to death and convinced Scott to eat his remains for their survival, which they did. Scott eventually ate Mickey as well, growing deranged in his isolation. During his isolation, Scoot came to regret how he had let himself fall out of contact with his friend Ray, or how he had never told Ray of his supposed debunking of the sheep squatch. Scott did not know that Ray's injuries came from a sheep squatch attack, though he began to suspect that Ray was hiding something. For his part, Ray did not know if Scoot survived the war, but invited Scoot to stay with them in Welch and hoped to reveal the truth to him there via a letter he left. By 2102, he had transformed into a Wendigo. Now to talk about our final case, besides the Wendigo Colossus, of course. Unlike these other cases, we do not know the identity or story of this Wendigo prior to transformation. However, it does have the unique name of Night Stalker. It is a Wendigo that prowls the area around the Sons of Dane compound. Constant partying from the group residing there previously agitated it to the point of insanity. One day, the Sons of Dane hatched a plan to lure the beast out in order to deal with it, but the creature killed members of their group first. The Vault Dwellers can still accomplish the goals of the Sons of Dane using music to attract various feral ghouls and later the Night Stalker itself. This can be done during the quest One Violent Night. Now it's time for that moment many of you may have been waiting for or curious about as I have mentioned it many times throughout the video but I think it's finally time we talk about the Wendigo Colossus or in multiples Wendigo Colossi. Wendigo Colossi are larger and more powerful Wendigo that have two additional heads, increasingly long and disproportionate limbs, and have a much larger stature than your regular variations of the Wendigo. Wendigo Colossi are encountered in nuclear blast zones, and are always accompanied by multiple regular Wendigos. Their scream can cause uncontrollable fear, causing someone to flee uncontrollably, although it is unknown if that is just a gameplay mechanic, or also in the lore as that is quite a powerful and strange ability. There is also a unique Wendigo Colossus inside of Monongah Mine. Earl Isle Williams worked at said mine previous to the Great War. He was a single father to Maggie after his wife left him, possibly due to a chem addiction. Hornwright Industrial bought the rights to the mine in April 2075, replacing the workers with auto miners. At first, this seemed like a blessing to the townsfolk, as it was plagued by financial hardship. The auto miners quickly and efficiently extracted all of the coal, however, and by January of 2076, there was no coal in any of the veins. Since the mine was no longer valuable, Hornwright Industrial prepared to leave that January. Williams and some other of the townsfolk drunkenly decided to steal some of the supplies from the mine before everything was taken away. Shortly after, Supervisor Deke Shrikes blew up the entrance with everyone still inside. Though Maggie tried to dig her father out with her bare hands, she was pulled away from others from the town, and lied to that he and the others had simply left. She didn't believe them, and reasoned they were either paid off by Hornwright's Industrial, or were unwilling to pay for a rescue mission. Inside the mine, Williams and the other townsfolk were facing a difficult decision. There was no food in the mine, however, one of the miners, James, died from injuries sustained while the entrance was collapsing. Several survivors agreed to cannibalise his body, including Williams, though others refused and stated they would rather die and be eaten than eat another person. At first, Williams questioned the morality of whether he should eat a corpse, saying it didn't seem right to him. After some time, as he and the others continued to eat those who died of starvation, he felt his sanity slip away, in part due to the lack of a day and night cycle. Eventually, his hunger got the best of him, and he found himself wanting to eat those not yet dead. Williams also left a holotape for Maggie. By 2103, Williams had mutated into a Wendigo Colossus. Hey, Max. Listen. I know I messed up. I never should have came into this mine in the first place. 
A few supplies ain't worth all this. Don't you for one second start thinking that I left you on purpose. And don't be going and blaming yourself either. <laughs> I can't be there for you anymore. But you're tough. And I know you'll be okay. Never forget your pops loves you more than... more than anything. Now, although it does not relate to Fallout directly, I think it would be interesting to mention, for those that are curious, that in several Native American beliefs, although the stories change slightly depending on which group you ask, a Wendigo is most commonly known as an evil spirit that is frequently associated with winter, coldness, famine, and starvation. It possesses and transforms human beings who have committed sins such as selfishness, greed, gluttony, murder, and especially cannibalism. The spirit then forces them to consume human flesh, turning them into a monster with an insatiable hunger for it. And that is everything we know about Wendigos within the Fallout universe. I hope you guys all enjoyed the video. Remember to like and subscribe and tell me what I did right, what I could improve on, and what other videos you would like to see. With that being said, I've been Sweet Tripod and I hope you enjoyed.